Welcome to Liturgical Chapel. As we begin our time of worship, hear this reading from 2 Corinthians. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
revolves around your throne. Who can know your glory? So high above, yet slain for us, you alone know. this reading from the Gospel of Mark. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, readers. Thank you, band, um, for that time of worship. I, I'd like to invite you to, to pray with me as we continue. Holy God, thank you for all of your gifts. Thank you for the opportunity, the privilege to come to you and worship, even as we are distributed in many different places. And God, we pray that your word would meet us where we're at in this time. May we be open to what you want to do in us and through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, so it was my first semester, my freshman year of college, uh, here at APU, where I attended. And I took a class that was at that time called Freshman Writing Seminar. Um, for me, I, I don't know about you, adjusting to college-level writing was, it was a bit of a process. Um, but I was trying. I, I felt like overall I was doing okay in the class and some of the other ones I was taking were I was writing essays. And at the end of the semester in this class, we were assigned a final paper, as you can imagine. Uh, the instructions were to write a narrative that detailed an important lesson that we had learned. Straightforward enough. Um, so I thought about an important lesson that I learned and spent some time, you know, kind of thinking about it, wrote out, described it, um, the importance of the lesson to me, why I thought it was good for others to have as a value for them and so on. And, and I, I distinctly have this memory as a while ago, but I distinctly remember feeling pretty good about this paper. Um, I, I even, I remember I emailed it to my parents afterwards for them to read. Um, Be proud of me, parents, you know, that kind of thing. Well, a week after I turned it in, uh, the professor returned the papers to uh, us at the beginning of class, and they were real papers. I don't know if you've seen that before, but it's, you know, you can touch it and everything. It's just a joke. Um, I looked at mine, and, you know, typically you kind of have to look through to the end to see what your grade was. And so I'm, I know that at the last page there's going to be this nice red, you know, big A, obviously. Flip to the back. There's no A. In fact, there was no letter at all. Instead, there were two sentences, and I'm paraphrasing, but this is pretty crystallized for me. Um, it just said, this was not the assignment. See me after class. Whoops. Well, we're in Mark chapter 9 today. Uh, this is a story commonly known as the Transfiguration. Um, it's also uh, marking... This Sunday, on Transfiguration Sunday, the end of the season of Epiphany. Um, the season where we look at stories of Jesus' life. Um, who is this Jesus? Who is he really? Um, and it's helpful to think of the Transfiguration in the lectionary, in the liturgy, as sort of a, a culmination, a cap on this season. Um, it's not a long story. Um, I'd love to invite us to listen again uh, for a moment uh, to this account from Mark of the Transfiguration. It starts with chapter 9, verse 2. It just says, After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. Uh, quick context before we keep going. It starts with six days previously or six days after that. What is that referring to? Um, well, it refers to a sequence from chapter 8. Uh, in summary, Jesus had asked his followers, hey, who are people saying that I am? Or more importantly, who are you saying that I am? And we saw Peter, one of the key disciples, respond, we believe you are the Messiah. God's anointed. And so Jesus begins to tell his disciples, hey, here's what the Messiah is all about. Here's what's going to happen. There's going to be suffering. There will be torture. The Messiah will die and the Messiah will rise again. And Peter wants none of this. This is not what he had in mind, apparently, when he said that he thought Jesus was the Messiah. And he tells Jesus, hey, you got to stop saying this stuff. This is, I don't think you have it quite right, Jesus. You're great, but not, you need to think differently. And Jesus, of course, famously tells him, 833, get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. It's quite a rebuke. 
Jesus then calls the crowd and the other disciples together and says, if they really want to follow him, they are going to have to take up their cross and follow him wherever that leads. And here we are six days later in Mark chapter 9. And some scholars would argue that the intention with that six days indicates narratively kind of an extension of that previous story. It's to show there's a connection here. Uh, This transfiguration story really is the part B of this greater story that started in chapter 8. And so we continue. And there he was transfigured before them. Verse 3, his clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. A few years ago, uh, my wife and I went whale watching. Uh, our, boat, our boat was uh, fortunate enough to, to kind of find and track a giant blue whale. Apparently, so the books say, the biggest animal that has ever existed on earth. I mean, I don't know about this specific one, but in general, you know, blue whales. And uh, it's hard to put into words. I don't know if you've seen one of these things live. Just how massive this creature really is in real life. I mean, the pictures don't do it justice. It's beautiful. It's awe-inspiring. It's also kind of freaky. I mean, it, it, it dawns on you, like, I don't think these things are hostile, but like one like well-placed tail whip and we will be capsized and drown in the ocean. That didn't happen, obviously. I have this weird mixture of a little bit of envy and, and almost a little bit of sympathy for Peter and James and John. On the one hand, can you imagine witnessing this I mean, a transfigured Jesus, Moses, Elijah, a voice comes from the cloud. This is amazing. But on the other hand, I mean, can you imagine witnessing this thing? I mean, you would think you were going crazy. This is insane. I mean, it would just be terrifying. What's happening? And it's that latter part that gives us... a frankly, one of my favorite little two-verse couplets in the Gospel of Mark. Um, This is verse 5 and 6. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And verse 6, he did not know what to say. They were so frightened. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Uh, So I remember some time ago, Uh, reading about an online computer game uh, with, uh, I think, maybe the best title ever. Um, This game is called, maybe you've played it, I don't know or heard of it. Um, There's a game called Pet the Puppy at the Party. This is real. Pet the Puppy at the Party. I've never actually played it. I can't, like, this isn't a recommendation per se. I can't vouch for it. Uh, But but I want to read you the game description of Pet the Puppy at the, or excuse me, Pet the Pup at the Party. Um, You are at a house party. This is a description. You do not know anybody, but legend tells of a, and this is emphasized, very good puppo, very good puppo, hiding somewhere in this house. The clock is ticking and you're running out of small talk. Can you find the pup at the party? So pet the pup at the party. And then you wander around. I saw the demo and you try to find this dog and avoid talking to people. That's the game. It's basically like a mild social anxiety simulator. That's the idea. It's an interesting premise for a game. Um, Naturally, people seem to love it. COVID has obviously changed a lot about these kinds of dynamics in our immediate context. Uh, But who of us hasn't showed up at some point to, to a wedding, to a party, a gathering of people where you just don't really know anybody? And that one recognizable person, that one friendly face, maybe even that one happy little puppo, makes all the difference. I'll be honest, there's a part of me that wants to feel a little bit cynical at Peter in this story. I mean, he blurts out this like goofy, 
unhelpful comment in the face of this awe-inspiring moment about tents. And there's speculation as to why, but the bottom line is, Mark tells us, he didn't know what to say. He was pretty scared. I mean, there are overtones maybe of Peter trying to kind of control the situation or at least maybe try to distract himself from this, you know, awesome, unthinkable thing that's happening right in front of his face. But I'll confess, I mean, whether it's building tents or, you know, finding a friendly stranger's dog at a party, I think there's something really human about counteracting that overwhelming experience with something that feels just a little more manageable, a little more calming, a little more centering, isn't there? I, I do think Peter was really trying. He was trying to make sense of the extraordinary, to harness the mysterious, maybe even control a little bit the uncontrollable. It's a relatable response. Verse 7. And then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. And suddenly when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. We'll stop there. Obviously, you already know this. Something had gone horribly wrong with my freshman writing seminar paper. Um, I talked to the professor. He explained uh, that while I'd written a nice essay about, you know, this, this value and lesson that I had learned, um, apparently it was just not a narrative. Like, apparently I had just sort of argued for this point in this didactic way, and I didn't actually make it a story. That seems pretty basic. It turns out the issue wasn't with my grammar or my sentence structure or, or even the lack of effort on my end. Um, I mean, I had done pretty well in all those things as far as it goes. Uh, I just hadn't understood the assignment. And I was allowed to repeat the assignment later on and I passed the class. Woo uh, but it took someone else in that moment, someone beyond my limited thinking, uh, to help me see what I didn't know I didn't know. What I didn't even see that I couldn't see. To help me hear what I couldn't hear. Peter thought, Peter knew what a Messiah was all about. Until Jesus, through his teaching, his transfiguration, a voice of God showing up in the cloud, it caused him to think, oh, maybe I have some things to learn. Maybe there is more to this Jesus than I realized. In our last liturgical chapel, uh, if you were with us, uh, we were invited to pray a, a prayer of commitment and surrender. Um, and we won't uh, go through the whole prayer again here, but I, I want to read a couple lines from this uh, for you, just to give you a flavor. Uh, this prayer said, let me be your servant under your command. I will no longer be my own. I will give up myself to your will in all things. Lord, make me what you will. I, I love this prayer. It's a prayer of, of surrender, of giving our lives over to God. And yet I find that even as I pray that prayer or, or those like it, as I desire to articulate, setting aside my own will, my own plans. Uh, I notice that so often what happens is new layers emerge in me. Where if I'm transparent, I am still holding on to things. It's really hard to let go of my own plans. It's really hard to let go of my own preferences for the future. It's difficult to let go of my reputation uh, my comfort zone, my need to understand and grasp everything. Uh, the truth is there are parts of me that, if I'm honest, I, I don't prefer to surrender. I wonder about you. Our passage earlier from 2 Corinthians uh, talked about a, a veil. Um, I wonder, is there any veil, 
anything between you today, if you're honest, and Jesus? Is there anything in your life that, uh, that you continue to hold on to, uh, or maybe that continues to have a hold of you? Are there places in your life where you, you've got your own idea of what God should be like, of what God should act like, of what God should do to make your vision for the future a reality? And maybe it's keeping you from experiencing the mystery of the true God revealed in Jesus. Are there things in your life that you are, if you're honest, attempting to control in an unhealthy way? Maybe you're focusing on building tents when a glorious God is leading you out to things, to places, to people that might be outside of what is normal, comfortable for you. In these kinds of situations, we are not unique and we are not alone. In fact, the ancient Christian practice of confession can help us just as, as, as it has helped generations of Christ followers. Confession allows us a space to orient ourselves towards God's initiating freely given grace to us. It's hard to receive something when your hands are already full isn't it? Confession is an opportunity to set the things we carry before Jesus and then to receive the grace he has for us. Um, So I want to read the words of a confession that in a moment I'm going to invite you to pray along with. Um, This is a confession inspired by the transfiguration story. Um, So I'd like to, again, read it one time through and uh, give you a chance to kind of absorb it. And then I will invite you to actually, if you are comfortable, maybe even out loud where you are, or maybe silently in your own heart, uh, to pray this prayer um, earnestly and honestly before God. And after that, I will um, share some words of absolution and forgiveness. Um, Listen to the words as I read them, and you see them on the screen of the prayer of confession for today. Here it is. Holy God... We confess that we often do not trust you fully. We have put our hope in worldly gain and in human promises. We have relied on our own plans, our own wisdom, our own sense of control. And yet we find ourselves defeated and lost when things fall apart. Lord, you offer us a love, a hope, and a peace greater than anything we could experience in this world. Please forgive us. Cleanse our hearts and our minds so that we might trust in you. Help us to release our need for control so that we might receive your will for us. Enable us to listen closely to your voice so that we might follow where you lead. Lord, we believe you. Help us with our unbelief. In the name of Jesus who loves us, we pray. Amen. And so I want to invite you. Confessions are not for those who have it all figured out. Confessions are for those who realize that they may not see what they don't see and need to take a step to simply say, God, help me. God, I want to release these things. Would you take over? Would you direct me? Would you guide me? Would I be open to what you want to do in me in these days ahead? And so if that is you, or if you want that to be you, think this is a confession for you. So let us pray this together, either out loud where you are or silently in your own heart. Let's confess together. Holy God, we confess that often we do not trust you fully. We have put our hope in worldly gain and in human promises. We have relied on our own plans, our own wisdom, our own sense of control. And yet we find ourselves defeated and lost when things fall apart. Lord, you offer us a love, a hope, and a peace greater than anything we could experience in this world. Please forgive us. Cleanse our hearts and our minds so that we might trust in you. Help us to release our need for control so that we might receive your will for us. Enable us to listen closely to your voice 
so that we might follow where you lead. Lord, we believe you. Please help us with our unbelief. In the name of Jesus, who loves us, we pray. Amen. And now hear these words of absolution and assurance of forgiveness that I want to extend. Um, First John reminds us, tells us that if we confess our sins, that God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So by the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, know that you are forgiven and loved. You are a new creation in Christ. Everything old has passed away. See, everything is becoming new. Amen. So be it. Take a few moments to reflect on these things in your heart as we transition to the Eucharist in a moment. Amen. In many liturgical traditions, the table is the the pinnacle of our worship together. And in this meal, in this offering, in this sacrament of grace, we are invited to participate in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who as Messiah did not stay up on a mountain but entered into our suffering, died, and provides life for each of us if we would accept it. And so a couple of things that are important to know in this season. Um, Obviously, COVID-19 creates a, a strange and unique setting for participating in something like the Eucharist. Uh, And so many traditions are are wrestling with this. And here at AP, we want this to be a a space of grace and possibility and not of obligation. Um, If within your tradition, within your um, conscience, that you feel freedom to participate, um, we want to invite you to do that today. And in fact, uh, you would have gotten an email last week inviting you uh, to prepare some uh, some elements beforehand. And go ahead and get those. Uh, But if for you, this is uh, more of a opportunity for a spiritual or remembrance uh, type of moment. Um, We want to create space for that as well. Um, It's a beautiful thing to be part of this body of APU uh, in all of its diversity. Um, And so uh, I want to ask you, wherever you are, to join me in praying together this prayer of the great thanksgiving as we introduce our Eucharistic liturgy. Let us pray. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Lord Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and with archangels and with all the company of heaven. Let's say this together. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let's continue in prayer. Holy and gracious God, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and to die as one of us, and to reconcile us to you, the God and Creator of all. And so on the night that he was handed over to suffering and death, Our Lord Jesus Christ took the bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And he said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of the faith together, that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Amen. Wherever you find yourself, physically, spiritually, whether there are things that you recognize you have let go, 
or things that you're still holding on to. The spirit of this open table is that you may participate, that you may receive. And if there is any part of you that wants in on the grace of Jesus, know that this is for you as I invite you to the table of communion. So come to this sacred table, not because you must, but because you may. Come to testify not that you are righteous, but that you sincerely love our Lord Jesus Christ and you desire to be his true disciples. Come not because you're strong, but because you're weak. Not because you have any claim on the grace of God, but because in your frailty and sin, you stand in constant need of his mercy and help. Come not to express an opinion, but to seek his presence and pray for his spirit. These are the gifts of God for us, the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Amen. Let's take this Eucharist together.
today's benediction, I just want to remind us of these words of absolution that you heard a few moments ago. So remember that 1 John tells us that if we confess our sins, that God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. By the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, you are forgiven loved. You are a new creation in Christ. The old has passed away and everything is now new. Go in peace. Amen.